Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Creative Cloud Workshop video recordings, hosted by Keyline, the Digital Design College. We have been shaping design workflows in KZN for almost the last two decades. We offer courses in graphic and web design, video production, 3D modeling, and much more. We're located on the Florida Road Strip in Durban. So the next time you're around, give us a shout and we'll be happy to show you around and assist you with solutions to whatever you're trying to create. Today, we'll be going over some tips and techniques in Adobe Photoshop. We all know Photoshop. It's one of those bread and butter programs that is a designer's best friend when it comes to raster image editing. There are a few tips and tricks and some cool techniques that I want to show you. Jibs and Sky will both jump in and also show you a few cool things. And these techniques will remind you why you fell in love with Photoshop in the first place. Let's go ahead and start off basic. We're going to start off with cropping. I'll grab my crop tool and let's see what's different with this. Firstly, these handles have been made a little bit bigger. It makes it easier for us to grab onto. We can also see when we look at this image that it's a little bit skew. Photoshop does give us the ability to straighten an image. Right on the top here, on my options bar, I have the word straighten. Now, of course, this is only popping up because I have my crop tool active. Right next to the word straighten, or rather before it is a little icon, and in all of my classes, I go ahead and ask that question. What does that icon look like? We'll have a little bit of silence and then some big strong person will confidently say, that's a handbag. Then, and we'll wait for a second and say, okay, maybe he's right. We'll usually have the quietest person in the class put their hand up and say, um, that's a spirit level. You know what? Indeed it is. I'll go ahead and click on the handbag on the top. And to straighten an image, I'll go ahead and click on where should be straight. So if I look at this picture, it would be nice if this horizon was straight. With that straighten feature active, my cursor has a spirit level underneath it. Click, hold, and drag across that horizon, making sure that my line goes across the horizon, showing Photoshop what should be straight. When I allow let go, Photoshop will go ahead and straighten that out for me. We do see that I've got some jagged edges there. That's Photoshop just giving me a low preview till I commit to that change. Now, before I commit to this change, we're also seeing that I'm losing a little bit of information on the sides. That makes sense. If you rotate an image, you're going to lose a little bit of information. I want to keep the original size of this image though. So I'm going to pull those sides up, pull that one out, pull this one down, and I'll pull this one out as well. That'll keep the original size, but in these areas right here, there's no information. Checkerboard, that's going to be transparent. Now, if I don't want that to be transparent, what I can do is turn on this little feature up here. That says content aware, and that taps into a little bit of witchcraft. Content aware is the name of the feature that's powered by Adobe Sensei. He's the artificially intelligent robot that lives inside the software. And he knows how to create pixels. He knows how to work with images. With content aware on, if I once more just extend those sides, I'll do that from the corner nodes this time to make that quicker. And now I commit to this change by pressing the enter key or by clicking the little tick on the top here. It'll take a second while Adobe Sensei thinks and analyzes. And there you have it. I've gone ahead and straightened this image. The areas where there was no information have now been filled in with extra pixels thanks to Adobe Sensei. That definitely takes cropping to a new level. Now we'll repeat that in a short while, but let's see what else we can do when we crop. I'll open up another image here. And this one is also kind of skew. 
But really what's happening here is it's out of perspective, meaning the areas that are closer to me look bigger, the areas that are further away look smaller. Grouped with my crop tool, I have the perspective crop tool. That one allows me to redefine the plane of perspective. I'll go ahead with that tool active, click on the four corners of the frame. Now, second click was fine. As I go over to the third, I start getting this mesh in the middle. Now it's looking more like a spider web or a grid. And that's actually mapping that perspective so that now when I commit to that change, Photoshop will go ahead and change the perspective for me. So I'll go ahead and extend my canvas just a bit. Of course, that's transparent. With content aware on, when I commit to this change, let Photoshop think for a second. Great. Adobe Sensei has filled in that extra information for me. I've got a bit more space to work with now. So this image is cool. It's a little bit, uh, a little bit peaceful though. What I'm going to do is, um, yeah, let's liven this up just a little bit. I've got a big scary lion over here. Let's bring him across. I'll just select all of him, copy that, come across and paste him in. All right, that's brought my lion in. I'll make sure my show transform controls are on so that I'm able to transform this image slightly. Now, as I'm doing this, I am not holding the shift key. What Photoshop has done is they've made keeping things in proportion as we scale a default setting. So without holding shift, when I move that, I'm proportionately transforming this. If I do, however, hold the shift key, I will now be distorting. All right, so keep that one in mind. When you're working with images now, stop holding shift in Photoshop or go over to your preferences and turn on the legacy transform. Okay, so I've got my lion in here. And the next thing I need to do, of course, is remove his background. We all know what that means. Let's make a selection. I've got my quick selection, maybe my magic wand. You know what? I'll activate that quick selection tool. And I'll ask Photoshop to do the work for me. Right up here on my options bar, I'll choose select subject. Photoshop will go ahead and scan that image and have a look at what the focal subject is. Great, it's found the lion as the focal subject. I can then go ahead and select and mask. That takes me into the special workspace or dialog box where I'm able to clean up the selection. Now I'll go ahead and have a look at my settings here. The first thing that I want to do is Photoshop didn't do a fantastic job with the hair here. And you know, I don't blame him. Hair is always really hard to work with. I'll go ahead and bring up my refine edge brush. That of course was created for hair and fur. And then I'll just go around the areas of that fur. And that refine edge is actually going ahead and finding out what's hair, what's background, and it's cleaning up and smoothening out that selection for me. That works, and I do have a slight little halo around that. I'll go ahead and just increase my contrast. Remember, the contrast will get away that will remove that fake halo that we get from adding a feather by using Refine Edge and making those fine wisps selected. The other thing that I want to do here is start getting rid of his leg portion here. I can take my brush tool and right from here, I can add some more like so. That's not what I wanted to do. I can go ahead and hold the Alt key or switch to minus on the top here to start erasing that. Great, so that's doing a nice little erase of that section for me. However, my brush is extremely hard. So as I'm erasing or bringing back, that's doing a very hard edge to my brush. Instead, let's decrease the softness. On a Mac, I'll hold Control, Alt, and I'll click and hold on my mouse. That brings up this red brush indicator. It's a little visual representation. 
while I'm holding in my mouse, left and right makes my brush bigger and smaller. Up and down makes my brush harder or softer. If you are on a Windows machine, you'll then hold Alt and right click. With a nice soft brush here. Okay, that's giving me a better result. So I'm able to nicely start erasing the parts of this image that I don't want to use. And once I'm happy with it, I'll go ahead right down to the bottom and choose to output this correctly. I could output this as a selection and that would just clean up my marching ants. Instead, I'll choose to output this as a layer mask. I'll click OK. And instead of deleting those pixels, what I've actually done is used a mask to hide them. Now, if you were to put that mask directly on top of the image, you'll see that what's in the white area, I can see on my screen. What's in the black area is hidden on my screen. If I need to go ahead and go back in here, back into that selected mask, I can double click on the mask thumbnail, like so. That takes me right back here so I can clean that up some more. I can also use the black and white to my advantage. With that mask selected, if I grab a brush, I'll go ahead and use that nifty shortcut again, Control-Alt, click and hold, make that a little bit bigger. And I can similarly come in here and start erasing parts of that mask. Now I'm doing a nice little soft erase. So I'm starting from outside that's it, and just letting my brush touch on the inside every now and again. Soften those edges just a little there. Great, the lion's looking pretty cool. Problem with the lion, however, is he's solid. I need him to start blending in here. In order to get my lion to blend into the background, I'll go ahead and use Photoshop's blend modes. Because this is on its own layer, it can have its own blend mode. Blend modes right here in my layers palette where it says normal, I'll go ahead and click in there. These are now live, meaning they don't record as a history state as I cycle between them. Simply moving my cursor over them gives me a little preview of what each of those blend modes do. Now remember what blend modes technically do is they tell the pixels above how to interact with the pixels below. Each one of those methods gives me a different effect. I think I'm liking the hard light here. That looks cool. I think this uh, little graphic just needs some text to finish it off. I'll grab my type tool and go ahead and just click once. Let's go ahead and type something in there. I'll type in the Lion King. And working with text used to be quite frustrating. Being able to get back into that area, highlight the text and make your edits. Now, even if I deselect that, simply double clicking on the text, will go ahead and highlight it so it's ready to be edited. I'll start off by changing that font. Yeah, I'll keep that color as white. And I wanna change the size. Now, instead of clicking on the drop down and trying to choose a size or entering a value, this is a numerical field. And what Photoshop has done with numerical fields is if I hover over the icon, I get a double ended arrow. That means I can scrub this value. Click, hold, and pull to the left to make smaller or right to make bigger. I'll take my move tool and simply move that a little bit lower. And there we have it, fantastic. I'm able to create a nice little blend here, extend that canvas and put in some text. So select subject works really well to select that line for me. What happens, however, when we have multiple subjects within a picture? Select subject, let me repeat those steps. Select subject in this case, we'll select both of those subjects, the parent elephant and the calf. That's not what I wanted. I just want to select the parent elephant. So I'll deselect that. Come on, D. I can use the same select subject engine 
but choose an area to focus it in. Grouped with my quick selection tool is a new tool called the object selection tool. With the object selection tool, I can click, hold, and drag a rectangular selection over the parent elephant, and that will use select subject to only select a subject within that area. Great, that's done a pretty good job of that parent elephant. I do have a few areas where there's a few problems, like just between the tail here and along the leg there. Instead of grabbing a lasso, I'll use that object selection again. And firstly, let's turn this feature off. If I try to subtract, so I'll hold my Alt key and take out of the selection here. Well, that's just subtracting a basic plain rectangle. That's not what I want. Let's undo that. Instead, I'll turn on Object Subtract. That now uses that same object selection and select subject engine. Hold Alt and I'll subtract that area. Great. That knows straight away what to subtract. I'll repeat that again right here by the leg. And that's cleaned up that selection nicely for me. Now, let's go ahead and make a change. We've got a selection. Let's do something to it. I'll open up my gradient palette. And this is probably something that you don't visit very often because gradients in Photoshop and using the palette have just not been a common part of workflow. But it's undergone a little bit of a makeover. They've added a whole heap more and they've gone ahead and categorized them. So I've got little folders like so. I'm gonna go ahead and use this rainbow right here. And in order to use it, I'll just drag it onto the elephant. And I know right now you're thinking, no, Nick, what are you doing that's destructive? You've just ruined this picture. I'll open up my layers palette. When using the gradient palette here, dragging that over to my selection, what that actually does is creates right here an adjustment layer as well as a layer mask for me. So it saves me a step. I've got that color in. Let's go ahead and create a blend, just like we did last time. My live blend modes, I'll hover over, seeing some cool effects. Uh, let's stick with maybe some soft light. And there we go, show your true colors, Ellie. All right, so cool, we know how to work with masks and we know how to add gradients, create adjustment layers. Let's see how we can do some of these steps a little bit quicker. I'll move over to my next image, open up my layers palette. And what I have is this nice background and then a model with her own background. We of course want the ability to remove this background so we can see her in this nice botanical garden instead of in the middle of the forest. I'll select the model layer, go over to my properties panel, just like in Illustrator, the properties panel gives me so many more options now. I'm able to access little areas of the program right through here. I can do some transformations, alignments. In my quick actions, I can very quickly select the subject or skip that step and just remove the background. Let Photoshop think for a second. And that's actually done a fantastic job. It's even pretty clean along the hair here. Let's see what that's done in my layers palette. Just like we're used to, it's made a mask, a mask that can now be edited. So Photoshop's saving me so much time. All right, enough of working with uh, pre-created images here. Let's start a new document. For those of you with a bit of a creative flair, let's start from scratch. Photoshop has created this little feature called Paint Symmetry. Let's have a look at how that works. What it does is I'm able to create something with my brush. Photoshop will go ahead and create the repeats for me. In order to use Paint Symmetry, I'll go ahead and first activate my brush tool. Let's open up that layers palette. I won't do this on the background. I'll do that on a blank layer like so. Brush tool active on my options bar, this little butterfly here, that represents my paint symmetry. So like I said, it creates repeats. I have a few options here, the vertical symmetry, 
Meaning if I draw something on the left, it will repeat on the right, horizontal. If I draw on the top, it'll go over on the bottom. My favorite of this list is of course the mandala. Now what that does is it creates little segments on my screen for those repeats. When I choose it, I can go ahead and choose how many segments I want to work with. I'll increase that count up to eight. Click OK. Lovely. And that brings up this little guide for me. Now, like I said, this is just a guide. I'll make that bigger. That can go off my page, that's OK. And accept that change. Great. Now that I have my segment set up, anything I do in one segment will repeat across the others. Let's have a look at how that works. I'll decrease the size of my brush here. And I'm just using my square brackets for that this time. Start from one end. And I'll just go ahead and create a nice little flower like so. I just created this one element. Photoshop goes ahead and repeats that across for me. I'll go ahead and change the color that I'm using and create another edit. Each time I create something, Photoshop will go ahead and repeat it. Even if I go ahead and I'll change my color one more time. Let's go with a nice light pink. And I'll just put a little dot in here. Let's make that just a bit bigger. There's my repeat. So that's absolutely fantastic. That works well for me. Now, you may have noticed that as I was drawing this, you guys probably think I'm really good with this brush tool. I mean, no handshake at all. Look how smooth my lines are. Nah, that's not true. I'm actually using a little feature in Photoshop. I'm gonna go over to my layers, turn this original one off and create a new layer. I had my smoothing value set to 100. If I decrease the smoothing and I try to repeat that, still looks cool, but as my hand moves, those edges aren't looking as smooth. Those edges are now a little bit more rough. Compare those edges to those edges. So smoothing will go ahead and even if my brush stroke has a little bit of movement in it, it keeps that nice and smooth for me. It does make the brush a little bit sluggish, but the result is quite nice. Let's go ahead and repeat that whole gradient thing that we did earlier. I'll open up that gradient palette. Choose a gradient that I want here. Let's go with maybe some nice blues. And I'm going to drag from my gradient palette onto my background layer. That now goes ahead and creates that adjustment layer. Because I had no selection, my mask is completely white. That's cool if I don't like this gradient and I want a different gradient, I can actually go ahead and just drag that on top of that adjustment layer. It'll update. If instead, I don't really want a gradient, I want a solid color. Close down my gradients palette and instead open up my swatches. This has also had a little bit of a facelift. I'll take one of these colors, drag it over that adjustment layer, and that's replaced my gradient fill with a color fill. Let's close that down. We have one more option through the window palette. I'll go over to patterns. Also, probably not something we visit too often, at least for the ones built into the program. They've given me access to some folders here. I'm gonna go with some water. I'll drag the water over that adjustment layer. And I've got that water pattern. Once more, like I said, as an adjustment layer. Now we've looked at adding to images. So we've added elements, we've gone ahead and added another image, removed backgrounds. Now let's have a look at how we're able to remove elements from an image. I'll go ahead and open up this picture I have of the Durban beach. Close down that patterns palette, it's getting in my way. Now, I think this is uh, pretty typical of Durban's beach. 
got a bin and I've got a whole heap of dirt right next to it. Yeah, that sounds about right. I want to remove this dirt. Let's see how I can do that. Of course, we could probably clone stamp a neighboring area into, the, into that spot. Or I'll start off by making a selection. I'll go ahead and there we go, very nice. I'm actually not making a very clean selection here as you can see. I'm taking more than I need. What I wanna do now is fill this area in. I'll go over to Edit, Fill, and in there, under Contents, there he is, Adobe Sensei, Content Aware. I'll choose Content Aware and OK. Let him think for a second, deselect that area, just like magic, he actually filled in what would have been there had that not existed. Now, for those of you with a clinical or critical eye, how that works, of course, is it copies neighboring pixels. If I zoom in, you'll see that we've got this little white area of debris that's been copied across and across. So if you have an eye for patterns, you'll probably find a few repeats. So content-aware fill is absolutely fantastic for something like dirt, but there are times when it doesn't work the way you think it would. So we need to use it in a more powerful way. I've got Jibs over here, and he's gonna show us what happens when the normal content-aware doesn't work. Okay, so the only issue with content-aware fill is yeah. that when you use it, you only see the results after you've applied it. So taking, for example, this image that I have right here, I've got this beautiful little butterfly that's missing a part of its wing. And I wanna go ahead and bring that information back. So I'll grab my lasso tool, make a selection of the area that I want to fix up. Again, if I'm really skilled with the clone tool, I could, do, I could use that, but let's say I'm running out of time. So we'll repeat the process, edit full. Let's go ahead and choose content aware, click okay. And I'll get a result like that. Not bad at all, right? Could use some more work, but not bad at all. But the problem is, if I want the concrete to come back at a certain point, I can't do that because when you apply content to wear full, it is actually a fully destructive effect. As you can see in my layers here, there's no extra layer. There's no layer for me to remove. Uh, if I made a mistake and I close this file and save it, there's no way for me to go back to the original one. Right, so even though content aware full is cool for quick adjustments, uh, if you want to work non-destructively, it's of course not the way you want to focus on working with it. So what they've created now is a two-step process. Number one, to have the ability to see the results before applying it. And number two, for it to be non-destructive and adjustable if you want it to be later on. And that's the introduction of the content aware dialog box. So it's still found in your edit menu, content aware. Once you activate it, you'll go into this mode here. On the left-hand side, you'll see a preview of your selected area that you want to replace. On the right-hand side, you see a live preview of what the result is going to be. So the cool thing is I haven't committed to anything. I haven't applied it. I'm at this point where I'm messing around and trying to figure out what works and what doesn't. And it'll only commit till I click the OK button over there. So at this point in time, I can do whatever I want. Now, the nice thing about the content aware dialog box, if you still see this green highlighted area, that's Photoshop telling you where it is getting the pixels to replace that missing piece from. And you have full control over this. So if you see there's a part that you don't want, by default, you're gonna go ahead and select <clears throat> the sampling tool. By default, it's set to just subtract. And then if you don't want an area to be part of the replacement, you simply go ahead and get rid of it. And then you'll see the result of the remaining areas that is left. Now in this case here, because I wanted to continue with the wing, I wanna keep this information part of it. So the opposite of subtract is to add and the button that we use in Photoshop to do the opposite of anything is most of the time Alt. So I'm gonna hold on the Alt key, toggling all the way up to the positive mode. So I'm gonna add in, I'm just gonna bring this information back in over here. And of course, with all butterflies, they are to some extent symmetrical. I need the excess information on the left-hand side here as well. I don't bring that through. All right, so I'm gonna give Photoshop the ability to sample the entire wing on the left-hand side. Now again, I'm seeing a preview, not bad at all, but not perfect by any means. There's still some work that needs to be done. Let's zoom into that area a little bit more so you guys can see some detail there. So we can see it's getting a little blotchy over here. 
Thereafter, what we have in the dialog box is also the ability to tweak some settings. So if you look here on the right hand side, we have a section here called full settings. And one setting that I want to apply is because I know it's going to be bringing pixels in from the left hand side, and I know it wants to be kind of reflected, we have an option here called mirror. So I'm going to go ahead and switch it on, let it think, and see the result. Thereafter, we have another option here called rotation adaption, which is basically going to scan and see whether the pixels are kind of matching. By default, it's set to none. I'm just going to go ahead and start off with medium. You can work your way up from low to high to see the results that you get. And this is way more closer to seeming like something realistic than what I had prior to this. Now, the main thing is, if I'm cool with it, if I like the way it looks, I can even go to color adaption as well to see how the matching of colors between pixels work and getting a better blend between it, right, to give me a result. Once I'm happy, I can go to output settings over here and I have three options. I can either choose to output this directly to the current layer, which will make this destructive, replacing the current pixels. I can choose to output to a new layer. Now with the new layer option, it's gonna create a transparent layer with only the new pixels. So it won't contain the butterfly, it'll only contain the replacement pixels. And that's what I'm trying to aim for. But if I wanna make any changes or edits to it, I don't want to affect the image underneath. So I'm gonna go ahead and select new layer, click okay. If you glance in my layer panel over here, there you can go ahead and see just the bit of pixels that have been generated. Now, for those of you who obviously been working uh, with Photoshop for a long time, you're familiar with how layers and stuff works, right? Um, Remember, when it comes to making changes, the best way is to always apply a mask. So even if I come into this guy here, I want to make a few more adjustments to it, I would normally just make sure the layer is selected, hit this little button at the bottom to apply a mask, and using something like my brush tool and paint in black, just go ahead and adjust. The main thing is if I go ahead and remove this, I'll see what was underneath. And I haven't erased the pixels, I've just hidden them. So if I'll bring them back by painting white, I can always paint that information back in. All right, so the content aware full dialog box gives us the main thing, which is a preview, allows us to make adjustments before applying. All right, another cool addition to Photoshop, it's been around for a while, but a lot of people don't use it that often, but especially if you're designing a lot of digital based stuff, this is gonna make your lives a lot more easier, is the introduction of working with artboards. Now, of course, with Illustrator, you understand what artboards are. And the concept of an artboard is the ability in a single document to have certain dedicated areas for export of different sizes. So we're not creating a document of all the same size. We want to be able to have maybe a social media size page, something for a business card or a letterhead or something for a poster. But we want to keep it in one single document. And the advantage of Photoshop's artboards is just that. It allows us to develop a design for multiple screen sizes in one single document so we can always compare as to what elements look like. Now if you don't know how to create an artboard it's normally available when you go file new and you start off by either going to web or mobile or flip. So when you're adjusting or creating a new document there's a little checkbox right here on the right hand side that allows you to switch on the ability to work with artboards. So if for example I go into print right, and I choose a particular size I'll choose artboards over here and then I'm uh, able to begin working. Do note, however, that when you choose the artboard option to create or work with artboards, in regards to color mode specifically, you are restricted to working in the RGB color space. So you won't be able to create multiple artboards that are in CMYK. You can convert them at the end, but in the beginning you're not. Whereas with artboards off, you see you are able to select all the different color modes that are available. Hence the reason why we go into the web categories to see that on as a default, and that's how you can set it up. Now I've got one year set up already. And that's the starting process. The difference is not that much. It works exactly the same way as you would work with any Photoshop document, apart from the fact uh, that you are working in the same PSD with multiple documents at the same time. So how does it work? Well, I'll go ahead and I'll just plonk in this uh, little graphic that I have here on the side. And exactly the same way, we can scale stuff up. The difference with an artboard, however, is when you're moving elements and taking them off the screen, for example, we actually get a, the ability to see that it's getting clipped or basically nested within this artboard. Now, a lot of times, this is where people get a little bit frustrated. If you've ever used artboards, it's like, okay, I want something to be an artboard, but if I move it too far, that happens. When you take an element outside of the boundaries of an artboard, it stays on its own 
where it's actually residing is in this entire area over here, which is in a sense infinite. That's your paste spot. So this is where you can keep graphics and stuff that you don't want to export, but you want to keep access to them within the document. If you want something to be uh, in an artboard or it be exported, it needs to be part of the artboard. And Photoshop has an automated feature in regards to that. So when you drag an element into an artboard, then only does it nested within it. So if you find that's a bit confusing and stuff that basically have always keep an eye on your layers panel to see whether your graphic is bounded to your artboard or not. Now, how do we make more? They've added in now inside or underneath your move tool, the artboard tool. To access your artboard tool, you can press V twice on your keyboard and that will access it for you. When you activate the artboard tool, number one, we get the ability to edit the existing artboard by either increasing or decreasing in size. We have the ability to add more. Now you notice there's four plus signs, especially when you're designing for screens and stuff, you wanna work with a logical sequence. So I wanna go ahead and create another screen at this size. As long as this artboard is selected first by clicking on its name, you hit the little plus sign and that will create another artboard that's empty based on the previous size. Now, if you wanna adjust this, let's say for example, you wanna design a layout for a phone device or a phone screen, right? You can then hop over to the top in your control panel where it says size, you can choose from one of the preset sizes over here. So I'll go with an iPhone 8, for example. And, and that will give me an artboard based on size. Another ability that the artboard tool gives us is the ability to position it where we want it to be. So again, if you're finicky about alignment and positioning, you do have the ability in Photoshop using the artboard tool to go ahead and duplicate, uh, to go ahead and move the artboard after you're done. Right, so that's a couple of things that you can do with artboards. It's very straightforward. There's nothing that's too complex. It's just understanding that elements need to be within a page for it to work. Adding in again, you can hit the plus sign, which will duplicate. And if you want to as well, where there's a blank area, you can go ahead and click and drag to draw out a custom sized one as well. So you can either use presets, duplicate documents, or draw custom based artboards as you require them. And, and of course, to delete an artboard with the same tool, you're gonna go ahead and select it and it's hit backspace over there to delete it. So that's the creation and working with artboards. And of course, when it comes to populating them, we can use a whole bunch of things. I've got this little lightning bolt here. Now, if I want to take this and put it into the second artboard, Logic would tell me, make a copy of this layer, put it into that one there. It works very similar to groups, if you've played around with groups in Photoshop before. But it's even easier if you simply select it, Alt and drag, and drag it into the next artboard. It will automatically populate and go into that folder for you. So you don't have to manually put it into them. So we can go ahead and like put some graphics together here. I'm gonna go ahead and put some text in. And now Nick has shown you guys some of the type options that are available to you in Illustrator. Most of them have obviously been brought over to Photoshop as well. So I'm just gonna go in here, type in power on. And of course you guys cannot see it because it's typed in white. So let's go ahead and just sample the color to match on right there. Right. And when working with artboards, the only reason you're probably gonna do that is if you're working on a particular campaign where there's gonna be design elements that are gonna be shared across screens. So for example, I go in here and I put in the text, let's go Command T to make that a little bit bigger and position that in place. And of course, I want it to be on the other side. So using what I just showed you, I'll make a copy of that and just alter the size accordingly. Now, for whatever reason, imagine this being duplicated onto three, four, five, or even six more artboards. Uh, if you decide, okay, I want to change the word power on or maybe the color of the ON to something else, just to contrast it a bit more. So let's go right into the red side. Problem is, I made the adjustment on one item. And in Photoshop, I want it on the other side there as well. Right, so number one, it makes it a little bit harder to keep track of items. And then if you do want to make adjustments, you're going to have to repeatedly do those adjustments. So here's one cool little trick you guys can use if you're working with Photoshop if you have elements, especially text-based items that you want to keep consistent throughout uh, while you're working with it, is this. I just want to delete that one there. I want to select this guy here, power on, and we set this color back to that green that I was using. And then all you do is take advantage of your libraries panel. You've probably seen this panel a lot of times when you're working in Photoshop. It pops on by default, especially on new installations. You want to just basically use this. Now, how do we use it is we take the element that we want and we drag it into here. Simple drag and drop, you'll notice there's it there that it's placed. Now I'll take it from here and place it back onto my artboard. Now, sometimes, especially with text, you will only see it till you commit or you press enter. And, and let's look in the layers panel and see what we have. 
If I pop back to my layers panel, in the original Artboard 1, that's still a text layer. In Artboard 2, however, this is now a linked smart object. But where it's linked to is actually to your cloud or your Creative Cloud. So I want to make sure that all of them come in from the Creative Cloud. So I'm going to go back to Artboard 1, remove that text layer, and simply make a copy of this to go through. Again, this can be used one time, two times, three times, or even four. And thereafter, to make changes to it, I just pop back to my libraries, double click on that. And this will open up in a new tab. If you're familiar with or have ever worked with smart objects, this is me opening it up in a new tab. It's still a live text layer. So I'm able to double click in here, go ahead and maybe even change the color. And, or even if I want to, I can go ahead and change the word itself. So let's make that power off. Let's reduce the size a bit. Hit that little tick. And the important thing for it to update, I need to save, then close. And then we see that wherever that instance has been used, automatically it's been updated. You can use this technique for any graphics, icons that you make in Photoshop, or even live text. So as long as you're able to create something like that in your layers, be able to throw that out. So Artboards is a cool way to keep consistent design ideas together in one place. Instead of having to resort to use individual single PDA PSD documents, you can do this via the Artboard panel. Another cool thing that they've applied into Photoshop, again, is for exporting and taking out. Now we know the common thing, if you want to save a file, just go file, save as, choose the format and go through there. Some of us who are familiar with Photoshop for a while, especially for online usage, are familiar with file save for web. Uh, but for asset-wise and asset generation, especially if you start working with Artboss, here's a couple of things that you guys can do. So if you go to your file menu, when you're in an Artboard-based document, and you go to export, you'll see that we have two distinct options specifically for Artboard-based files. The first one is the ability to export Artboard documents to files. So if I choose this, I will get this little dialog box here, choose the des destination, uh, prefix, and choose the file type, right? So I can jump between PDA, uh, bitmaps, JPEGs, PDFs, all the way down to PNG 24 pings. What is this though? What is this gonna do is it's gonna take every single artboard you have in your document and it will allow you to export them as individual files for whatever use case scenario. So if you're creating stuff that goes onto social media, goes onto websites, goes onto different size screens, instead of giving somebody a PSC and for them to try and figure out how to export one artboard at a time, you can export all of them in one go from here. Of course, if you choose PSDs, the advantage of using that is you will retain the layer structure that you have. So if you just want somebody to have access to one of your artboards with its contents, you can go ahead and just do that instead of having to resort it. Now, of course, if you're trying to go online, then you can use any of the image-based formats from here. This will allow you to export again, each and every artboard as its own file. If you want to send this to someone who doesn't have PR Photoshop and they just want to view what stuff you've made, and you want them to do a review, for example, then you can choose File, Export, to PDF. And what this will do is, of course, make a PDF, but the point of it, at the bottom here, we get to choose whether it's a multi-page document or document per artboard. So you can either have individual PDFs of each artboard, or you can have one PDF with multiple pages, so each artboard represented on one page. So we have quite a few options now when it comes to exporting, especially, especially artboard-based files um, out of the program. Again, if you go back to file export as well, one of the last new adjustments that we've made is we've got export as available to us as well. So if I go file export, export as, I'll get this dialog box over here. Here I can go ahead and choose individual artboards. Right, and I can also choose what scaling that I want to use. Sometimes when you're designing stuff, you're probably working at a particular size, maybe a thousand pixels by a thousand pixels or whatnot. And then when you need to export, you need to export it for high DPI or retina based screens. So here you can quickly go ahead and choose which suffix you want, uh, basically which scale adjustment that you want to use. And you can add that as to more of the list. So if you need one times, if you need three times, and for example, if you need uh, half for whatever reason, you can use that. And basically, these two layers or these two documents will be exported at each of these sizes for you. So just uh, for example, like how Illustrator works, where you get a subfolder with each item labeled, you will get the same thing here as well. And of course, we have access to the basic web formats here. So PNG, JPEG, GIF, and also SVGs are supported through this dialog box. 
Okay, guys, so those are just some of the export options that you guys have available to you here in Photoshop. A little trick working with the library panel, which we'll discuss more off a little bit later on, and then working with exporting as well. Cool, I'm gonna send this back to Nick and he's gonna go ahead and show you guys some more cool stuff. Thank you. I've got another image open here, and Jip spoke a little bit about text and working with it. Sometimes when I'm working with an image, it already has text in it. I'll open up my layers palette, it's not a text layer. That's actually part of this image. Those are pixels. Photoshop now gives me the ability to make a rectangular selection over that text. I'm actually just going to go ahead and make that a little bit bigger. Great. I can then go ahead and use this new feature called match font. Type match font. That will allow Photoshop to scan what fonts being used there and show me what it thinks is similar. So instead of me trying to guess, well, it's a script, let's filter the scripts, Photoshop will say, well, these are the ones that I have on my computer, that's on the top of the list, and these are the ones that are available on the Creative Cloud. Annabelle here looks pretty cool. So I'll go ahead and activate this font. To do so, I'll just click on that little cloud icon. It'll take a short while to activate that font. Now that's on the top, which means it's on my computer and activated. I'll click OK. And when I grab my type tool, it's even gone ahead and made that my active font, meaning I can go in there and type in whatever phrase I'd like. And that's tried to find something in comparison to that font, something similar going on there. And so it's given me that option. Very cool. The other thing that I can do here is I can start bringing in Illustrator files. We looked at Illustrator earlier, and being able to integrate those files is an important part of workflows. There's two ways for me to do so. One way is I'll just go over to Illustrator and open up, there we go. I've got that little bird that I was working on. I'll select that bird, copy it with the command C, go over to Photoshop, and paste it with the command V. When I bring that in, I'll choose to bring it in as a smart object. What this is doing is embedding that Illustrator artwork. Move that over into place. Go ahead and commit to that change. I'll open up my Layers palette. And this is a vector smart object. So if I go ahead, and I'll just close this file over in Illustrator. Close that down. In my layers palette, if I double click on that smart icon right there, that'll go ahead and open that up in Illustrator for me. I'll make a quick change, quick little puppet warp like we did earlier. Let's bring that head a little higher, nice free bird, like so. I'll save this, command S, close it, go back over to Photoshop, and that updates. Now, what this has done is it hasn't edited my original Illustrator file. This is an embedded file. So that change was actually made inside Photoshop, inside the smart object for me. On the flip side of that, if I want that Illustrator file to be live and I want to make changes there and see them reflect here in Photoshop, I can go ahead and go over to File, Place Linked. I'll go ahead and choose, there we go, Artwork 1. Let's go ahead and place that in. So here's the Illustrator file that I'm placing. Now that's the gray bird. I'll commit to that. And this has a slightly different icon. It's got a link icon. The difference here is if I double click on this, it actually goes ahead and opens up the original file in Illustrator. Any change that's made here now on this original file, I'll just go ahead and select that body piece of the bird and let's give that a nice color. And we'll go with the lights green. I'll save that. Close it down, jump back over into Photoshop, and that updates. Anytime that Illustrator file updates, my file will update. 
that's a linked file. If it's an embedded file and a smart object, I'll have to come into Photoshop to make that change. Working with smart objects is something that is very important. Got another image right over here, and I'm just gonna apply a filter to him. I'll go over to filter, filter gallery, Let's zoom out there so we can see him. And let's do something extreme here. I'll go over to stylize and apply some glowing edges. Great, that's destructive. Look at my layers palette. I've gone ahead and edited those original pixels. Let's undo that. Instead, if I make this a smart object first, palette menu, convert to smart object, or filter, convert for smart filters, I'll click OK. That becomes a smart object. It's got his icon, filter, filter gallery, apply those glowing edges there. And what that does for me is I get the ability to turn the filter off, turn the filter on. I also get this free layer mask, meaning if I need to hide that filter from somewhere, I can do so. I can just grab my brush and paint in black to hide it from a particular area. I could also go ahead and grab my gradient tool. I'll grab a nice white to black, linear gradient, and on that mask, I'll just go ahead and draw that in. I can apply it from one side to the other. Using the same concept, it's black and white. Using a gradient, I'm able to create shades of gray in the middle there as well. I'm gonna open up my last image here. I've got this nice, cool pineapple. We saw this earlier. And there's a few things that we can do here to integrate this as well. Here's a cool little image, and I wanna be able to make something from this image. I'll use the Creative Cloud to do that. I'll open up my Libraries palette, and right on the bottom here is a little plus. I'll click on that and choose Create from Image. What this does is it opens up a little dialog box that uses the engine from the mobile app, Adobe Capture. I'm doing this within Photoshop. With my image, I can now go ahead and start off by making a pattern. I'll start off by changing the scale, maybe the rotation slightly. I can even move the area that I'm getting that pattern from. I've got different types of patterns on the top here to create different repeats. Yeah, I'm liking that. On the top here, I can change to create shapes, almost like a live trace. I can get some colors from my selected image, save those to the CC library so that I can use them as swatches in any of my other programs, or create a gradient. I can increase the number of stops for that gradient. I can even move around how I want that to graduate or gradually change. I'll go ahead and create a pattern for this. Save that to my CC libraries. Give that a second to update, and that's gone ahead and saved. I'll now go ahead and here's this last pattern that I created. I'll just, from my patterns palette, click hold and drag that onto my image. In my layers palette, just like before, that created an adjustment for me. And to edit this pattern, I'll double click, change that scale. Yeah, get a few more repeats like so. Okay. And change that blend mode. So from my image, I just very easily created a little repeat, almost like I was in Illustrator. I can then save that to my library and quickly dump it onto my screen. This Creative Cloud is so important and we'll be diving into it a little later on. Before I go any further, I've got Sky here and he's got some tips and tricks that he wants to show us in Photoshop. Cool, thanks Nick. Hey guys, these features that have been at Photoshop for quite a while, uh, we find still resonate quite a bit. Even with seasoned users that are, that are discovering stuff like layer comps and so on. They're still pretty powerful and we still 
feel and find from talking to uh, Photoshop users out there that many people still haven't discovered them. So um, let's show you how that works. And hopefully those of you guys that are using it, great. I, I know for sure there are loads of you that aren't. I'm sure you'll find some value from some of these features. So now Cree asked earlier on, uh, and some other people were interested as well, about the match color option. And I know that is uh, often a challenge where you've got an image photographed in one particular type of lighting with its own costs and so on, coming over to another target image. So I'm just gonna not do like a deep dive. I'm just gonna point out to you nonetheless. Let's see if we can um, show you guys the match color feature. So I'm just going to open up this image that I have here and we're going to click any selection tool and go to uh, use the cool select subject option. And then uh, I'm going to go to select and mask. And just off the bat, it does quite a good job with uh, extracting the foreground. So I'm going to, I'm just going to output to a selection because I can do that and copy, uh, go across to this layer document here, paste, skews the major differences in, in, in resolution size. Yeah, I'm just going to command T and uh, let's just go up there and uh, bring that down. All right. So if we want to kind of get the color matching a bit better here with the stadium background that we have, we can use this option in my adjustments menu called match color. So we start off at the bottom choosing the source. So where, are, where do you want to get your colors from? Uh, I want to use this particular document. You would see it's picking up the open Photoshop documents at the moment. So I want to use layers PSD. And uh, which layer do you actually want? Well, I want the background and that is the city pick. Okay, so you see it's looking at that background image and trying to get just a starting point. Of course, you have full control here. You can fade to sort of remove some of what it's done to get some of the original image back in. And then you can also control overall brightness so just by eye. And of course, your color intensity as well. And you can see that um, done a lot of the work for me in trying to match typically what that might look like if you know, she was photographed natively in that background. You also have a neutralize option here, which is going to remove color costs for you. All right, so that's the match color option. And of course, you can also choose a source from uh, a different document, as I pointed out earlier on. So Cree and Co, I hope that gives you an idea of the approach to matching color from one layer to another. So I'm just going to get rid of that and talk a little bit about layer comps. Now layer comps allow us to create variation and there's a couple of uh, variables, so to speak, that, that it can record as what we call a layer comp. So firstly, I just created a basic document here. I'm going to go to my, to my library palette and I'm going to bring in this little graphic that I've got. All right, what I'm going to do next is just create a layer comp because this is one option that uh, I want to start off on. So I'm going to go to my layer comps palette, which of course can be found in the window menu, and I'm going to create a new layer comp. And you could call this option one, or I'll just call mine original. Uh, you might find that these are all off. So what what do you want or what is possible rather that Photoshop can remember and record? Visibility, meaning which layers are off and on. I'm going to switch that on. Position, where are the pixels on that layer relative to your canvas? And of course, uh, you have appearance. If you have a, a smart object coming in, then you can switch that on so it looks in the smart object for further comps that, layer comps that might be programmed in there as well. Uh, this is pretty powerful, your appearance, your layer style. Uh, you know, there's quite a lot you can do there, like color overlays and so on. So, of course, I'm going to switch that on. And um, you don't have to worry too much about this. The best option is to just switch all of, all of them on. 
great. I'm going to click OK. I've got one layer comp. That's great. And now I want to create a, a second option. Perhaps I want to remove this white block or maybe this white box. Uh, I want to remove maybe the outer glow that I've got there. And I want to maybe put a little stroke there, which is at the top here. Of course, you can control your color and your thickness as well. Okay, I also maybe want to go to, I want to go to this uh, vector smart object and I'll just double click uh, at the end of that layer and I can do a, maybe a gradient overlay there. I can choose a gradient color that I might want. And then of course I can choose different, uh, different blend mode, et cetera, et cetera, to create uh, a, a, a ver any variation that I might want. Okay, so of course, uh, you know, sort of digging into your options for layer styles, there's, there's, there's quite a lot that, that you can actually do. And maybe I want to change the position of the emblem as well. So I'm going to take this little emblem and put it on the top there. Once I'm happy with that, I will create a new layer comp and I'll just call it option two. Remember to switch all of those on. I'm going to click OK. Great, and then to toggle between those, you can just click on the little box in the beginning and you can see it's just automatically, if you look in your layers palette, very powerful. Switches so appropriate layers offer on and also move stuff around. And uh, let's, let's go for a third option where I want to not see this little emblem that I've got, cool. And maybe let's hide this white box as well, okay. And uh, I'm going to go and do on the city pick, I'll just go and do a color overlay to get a different kind of theme happening here. Uh, let's go for something like that. And then of course I can go and change my blending. Okay, let's click OK. And of course I can do the same for, for text as well, which I've called city name. So I'm gonna switch that on, uh, double click in there. And uh, I can of course put color overlays or gradient overlays on my text if I want to. And then of course by creating a new layer comp option, it's gonna record all of that as a layer comp. So for repeated template work and canvases that are common with just small variations and variables for any designer creating options, you know, you fiddling in the latest palette quite a bit, changing stuff around and then coming back. And this allows you to very smartly save those as layer comps. You can, of course, go to your file menu and you are able to export your layer comps with various options. You can take them to PDF, to uh, multiple PDFs. Uh, you can also go layer comps to files, which is gonna call up this dialog box, which allows you to have more control to export each of those layer comps as separate files. And of course, after choosing your target destination area. Cool, so I hope that makes sense firstly and uh, gives you guys some kind of re-energized motivation to to use layer comps if you aren't already the next thing i want to show you guys is variables so i'm just going to i'm just going to go and revert this document and if i have common layouts that i want to create in this example maybe for different cities simple example and I don't want to have to create multiple layers. You can automate the process using variables. So I have a layer here, I've called it emblem. And then uh, I've given the actual name of the city. I've called it city name. It makes sense to me. I've got the white box and of course I've got the, the city picks as well. So to start this process, I'm just going to use the, the Durban template that I've got as a starting point. And to get this going, I've got to go to image variables. So uh, we're talking about variables, hey, not layer comps. So variables and I've got define. At the top here, I've got define and I've got data set. So I'm gonna start off with define. And this is where I would actually define the, the variables and how they're actually going to behave. So I'm gonna start off with emblem. What would you wanna do? Well, in certain instances, you'd wanna have it visible uh, on. And maybe if I've got 
Joburg Stadium here, you'd want to have it off. So I want to control visibility. I'm going to switch visibility variable. on. And for city name, I want the city name for all the variations. So I'm not worried about visibility, but I want to be able to change the text. And uh, I'm going to call this variable something more basic. So uh, city, I'm just going to give it the same name as my layers without any spaces and funny characters, as I'm sure you guys uh, are quite disciplined with already. And then I'm going to go to the white box. And yeah, perhaps I also want to maybe show that in certain instances and not show it in other instances. So I've got my vis visibility variable on. And then the city pick itself, what I want to do here is do a pixel replacement. So I want to be able to change the picture. Let me go back and just make sure that I've, okay, visibility, I've called it a white box, I've called it box, that's fine, city name, and then city pick, uh, I've called it city pick here, yeah, underscore's fine, but I'm just going to remove that underscore. I will just leave the fitting options as they are now. And once we've programmed that, that's great. Then I can go to my data sets. To get my first data set going, I'm going to click on this little button, create new data set, cool. And I'm gonna call this one, of course, Durban, right? And then I start off with my variables. Do you want the box visible? Yes. The city name is gonna be Durban 2020. That's fine. Now it does this weird thing I've noticed. I never did that with older versions, but once we click okay, it should preview uh, better. It should fix that up. And then the city pick itself. Okay, I'm gonna go and select file and I'm going to go to uh, things in this folder. I've got layer variables and I've got the Durban picture. Okay, cool. And the Durban emblem, do I want it on? No doubt, I want it visible. Yes, that's great. Cool, then I'm going to create a, another one, call this JHB, and uh, we can go from the bottom up, that's fine. Durban emblem, I don't wanna see that here. I want the city pick, I can choose my file, and that's gonna be Johannesburg. I'm going to go city name, of course that's gotta change call it JHB, okay, and the box you can choose, maybe we'll have it invisible for here, but I'm not gonna be able to see that, so I'll switch that on. You can apply, preview, and then of course create another one for Cape Town, of course, and I want the box visible. I want city name to say Cape Town, okay. I want the city pick, which I've got to change to Cape Town, click open, and the Durban emblem uh, invisible. Okay, so I've programmed those data sets and, uh, and I can then jump between them, of course, from this window. Okay, and it's automatically changing the layers, visibility, text content as well. And what I can also do is, uh, where this becomes powerful, guys, is you can create a Excel CSV and then import that, where you can have your variable names on your column headings. And you've just got to name the pictures to match. So, you know, you would say uh, Cape Town without spaces, .jpg, and Johannesburg without spaces, and Bloemfontein, .jpg. And somebody can punch that into a spreadsheet and then you can import that. And uh, you know, Photoshop will do all this work for you, bringing in the pictures, changing the, the text variable names and switching appropriate layers off or on, visible, invisible, etc. Pretty powerful. So you can also output, you can go to file again, you can export data sets as files. Okay, all your data sets. In fact, uh, there's another option here as well. Uh, apply data set, yes. If you quickly want to jump to a particular data set, you can go from that menu. And then as I was showing you, you can also go file export and export those data sets as files and uh, controlling all the options that you have in here. So 
if that's something that you think could be, could be useful for your workflows, play around with it, try it out. And if you need further assistance there, especially with the uh, spreadsheets and so on, um, need more clarification on that, give us a shout and uh, we'll be happy to set up time with you to get you going on that. Let's, let's get into uh, displacement maps just to give you an idea of, of, of what you can do there. So I'm going to go to good old bridge and I'm going to call up uh, the silk fabric image that I've got here. And I've got this uh, colorful, nice Africa image here. And I want to use the silk fabric and I want to kind of superimpose or print that, if you like, onto the silk fabric. So you can do this on brick walls and t-shirts and so on, if you ever have a need for that branding kind of work. But it can, you know, if you understand the concept of a, a bump map, then it can be used for various other instances. Hey, let's, uh, let's get that going. So what I want to do is start off preparing my, my bump map. And uh, the way I like to do that is just on a separate document. So in fact, what I'll do is command A, command C, and I'm not going to uh, command C and command B because let's, let's go with the disciplines that we were shown earlier on where I'm going to just drag and drop that onto uh, Photoshop from Bridge. And of course, it's going to create for me once I hit, so I'm just holding my Alt key there. It's going to create a smart object. You can see the little smart object icon. That's fine. Let's delete that. And what I want to do is I want to take this background and I'm going to go and duplicate layer. And I want to do this into a new document. So this time, uh, not in this document that I'm currently working with, but in a new document. And um, I'm going to click OK. And it's created a new document for me. I can change the mode to grayscale because that's all I need. Okay. And you would see that I've got some grain and texture and so on, which I don't need. I just need the, the, the main sort of texture, the main fabric folds and, and highlights and shadows here. So I'm going to go and blur that grain out. So I'm going to go and use a Gaussian blur. Okay, so a couple of pixels, two, three around there. Cool. And then I also want to exaggerate the highlights and shadows. So I'm going to go to levels. Keyboard shortcut for that is Command L. And I'm going to increase the difference between my highlights and shadows by dragging the left and right sliders. Great. If you want to blur it a bit more, you can, but we're going to leave ours like this. And I'm going to go to File, Save As. And let's, uh, I'll just put this on a desktop. I'll call it Displace as a PSD file. Click Save. And um, I'm done with this. I can close this down. I'm now going to come back here and I'm going to remove the blue background, but I want to show you how smart objects are pretty cool. Firstly, what I'm going to do is select this uh, and let's apply the bump map to it. So I'm going to go to filter, distort, and displace. Cool. Now here I can control the percentage of variation that I want this, uh, the edges to kind of move. I'll just leave it on, on 15, leave the rest of the settings as they are. I'll click OK. Then it asks me to choose the map, the uh, displacement map that I want to use. And this is the one down here. I'll click open. Cool, it does its thing. Doesn't look very impressive now, but there's a couple of things I wanna do. First, uh, let's get rid of this blue background. So I'm gonna double click to sort of unwrap uh, because that's what a smart object is. It's just a container, hey, protecting the contents. So I'm gonna double click to unwrap that. And I'm gonna go over to this, uh, this eraser also hidden old gem, uh, magic eraser. I'm just gonna go and click on the blue background to get rid of that. And let's close that down and save. Okay, and that's gonna come back here. And of course, then you can go to your blend modes to get it blending in in a better way. And I'm gonna maybe use overlay. Yeah, that's fine. You can play around with opacity and so on, and that's pretty cool. You can also, you can also go and double click for some advanced layer controls. You can go and 
double click uh, on the end here to call up your blending modes. And here on, uh, we can control what happens to the, to the Africa picture looking at the underlying layer. So what we do here, we go to our highlights, so this, the, the lighter parts of these folds, you kind of pull the slider to the left until it just starts to break up. So just before it starts to break up and then, and then you kind of hold the Alt key and you, can, and you can create now softer fades on that. Hold the Alt key and separate that. Yeah, you can release the Alt key now. And then I can get more softer highlights there. All right, so play with that. The cool thing with this is that you can also, because we did it as a smart object, you can move, this, move the, the layer around and it actually goes and redoes the whole thing, the whole distortion. You can also go and double click the displace option and you have controls here to go and change the strength of this displace filter.